for those that have never been around before, I essentially have never seen the PTR. I never look at the PTR because, or the PBE, whatever you want to call it, because I have this wholehearted belief that Riot have this knee-jerk reaction to changing everything right before the patch notes draw around. So I always, 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 always wait for the actual final product, which usually means that all the stuff that comes out is that much more shocking to me. And apparently people think that that's funny. So we ride. So that, given that, I will be seeing all these patch notes for the first time, including uh, reworks, changes, all of them. They're all different to me. And I will be not only reacting, but giving my you know, my take on them. If they're good, if they're bad, if they help, <clears throat> if they hurt, if they shouldn't have been considered in the first place, or if Riot's gone bonkers again. So if Riot's gotten into the into the stash today, we'll, we'll have known for sure. <laughs> so yeah, welcome to patch 13.5. I hope you are all doing well. Let's see what we've got today. So, what's up, cool cat? What? <laughs> cool cats. It's patch 13.5 and the cat's out of the bag. In this week's patch, we have Yumi's much anticipated rework. I don't know who was anticipating it. I was hoping she'd just be deleted, but you know, we're here. Several adjustments to Azir to help address his pro skew. Some buffs to roaming mid laners. Some buffs to counter jungling. In other news, we have changes to ARAM, including removing tower rubble. Update. Update on champion pricing changes and an announcement about the depreciation of our 32-bit client. That makes me nervous. Shit's broken again. More news at 11. Okay, let's get into it, shall we? First on the list, it's Yumi. <clears throat> Yumi rework, all abilities adjusted. It's here, chat. It's finally here. So first we had the, yep. Yumi's gone, Yumi's dead, now Yumi is back again. So, Yumi's rework is arriving in 13.5 with a few new spells, some cuddly VFX, and aims to address some core frustrations that have plagued our feline friend. The biggest change is to her passive feline friendship, which now builds a special bond with her teammates until one becomes her best friend. Oh god, that's so cheesy. Anyway, this new bestie will then enhance Yumi's abilities as long as she is attached to them. Our goal is to make laning matter much more for Yumi, especially since she's going to scale just as well as other enchanters while being untargetable. Still, we're keeping the untargetable thing, are we? Okay. We've kept it as a dynamically growing bond because, well, that's what cats do. Yeah, I don't know about that one, Chief. <laughs> but also, in case something goes ferociously wrong, you should feel free to swap and not be hindered the entire game. Beyond her passive, we've made a few more swaps to Yumi's abilities, such as making healing more combat-based and her enchantments more... Marks but skewed. So what? They're making her into Ardent Sensor? Yes, Yumi has been reworked as an item. We're going to make her into Ardent Sensor. That's the plan. This should abate some of the high frustration moments when Yumi can abandon her lane partner and follow powerful bruises. I see. I see. So we're hoping for that. While we're not positive that this completely solves the, every problem for Yumi, we're hoping this puts her in a better place for most players while making her less dominant in pro environments. So health growth down, base mana up, and then we got here we go. Feline friendship. Okay, so base armor. When Yumi spells or attacks effect champion, she heals herself and charges a heal for her allies. If she attaches within the next four seconds, she brings the heal to her ally as well. While attached, this effect automatically occurs. Making friends. While attached, Yumi builds friendship whenever her ally kills enemy champions and minions. Each ally has their own unique friendship score. Well, while we get attached to our best friend, Yumi's abilities gain bonus effects. So cooldown 20 to 10 seconds between levels 1 to 11. And then it stays at, at 10 for the whole game by the sounds of it. The heal amount is between 25 and 110, plus 15% AP. Okay. And then while Yumi's passive is ready, her auto attack range is increased by 50. Uh huh. Okay. So. That's interesting. Let's go over the whole kit first before I give my entire set of criticisms. There may be some more that I'm missing, so we'll just give it a sec, yeah? So, Q, prowling projectile. So Yumi fires a missile that slows the first enemy hit. If cast while attached, Yumi can control the missile for a short period, as we know, before it becomes overpowered, greatly accelerating and slowing enemies by an increased amount. And then best friend bonus. The ability slow will always be empowered, and hitting enemy champions also grants... 10 to 20 plus 10% AP on hit damage to an ally. 
This damage is increased up to 75% based on our allies' critical strike chance. Jesus. Okay. All right. I get what they mean about marksman skewed now. So cooldown, down 7.5 towards 6, and then mana cost 50 to 75. Damage 60 to 210 to 20%. AP. Only a 20% AP ratio. That's not that bad, I guess. But I mean, given what it gives now, it's a bit crazy. But also, yeah, the empowered damage. The empowered damage is almost 400. Are you kidding me? Fucking hell. Up to 380 damage and 35% AP. And then the empowered slow is literally 80%. Are you fucking joking? Projectile missile width is slightly less. Hitting an enemy with Yumi's Q now reveals them, but it does not reveal stealth enemies. Okay. That helps. I suppose. I don't know. Anyway. W. You and me. Adaptive force bonus is removed. The summon airy positive boon is removed. Good. Best friend bonus has been added. So Uni gains an additional 10 to 20% heal and shield power based on ally level. And her best friend gains 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 on hit healing. This is affected by Yumi's heal and shield power. Fucking hell, man. So they're trying to also dissuade people from building full AP on Yumi as well. So you actually do have a reason to get uh, healing and shielding power on Yumi as well. Oh... E, the zoomies. Alright, so instead of healing, it now shields people. Which actually gives it some sort of counterplay in regards to, like, Shadow Flame and, and like, Serpent Fang, I guess. But even then, like, yeah. Plus, it's a temporary as well. It doesn't, like, keep them in good shape. Which also helps, in a way, if you're actually, like, in that spot. Which kind of helps out. See. Morning, Vega. How you doing, mate? I'm just trying to think. Does shielding mean more than healing by default? The answer is usually no, because the healing obviously gives you more like permanent permanent stats. But the shield strength being as high as it is, and the ability to give them like uh, this is essentially like they just remade Yumi into Ardent Sensor. Like I just need I need a picture of Ardent Sensor to be my uh. To, to be my next thumbnail for this because it's just like we just we literally just remade Yumi into an ardent sensor. That's literally all they did. It's like fuck this uh, fuck this particular champion. Let's just make her into an item. <laughs> so Alice just a twenty percent bonus uh, twenty percent movement speed while Yumi's E shield persists until the shield is broken or it decays after three seconds. The, it gives an attack speed bonus of thirty five percent or eight percent plus eight percent per hundred AP. The anima, anchor mana restoration is that you get. You will restore mana to your anchor. And then Zumi does not have a best friend bonus because Yumi should be able to save all her allies. Great. Just great. Just bloody great. Alright, and then final chapter. So for 3.5 seconds, Yumi fires five magical waves. This doesn't seem to be anything different. Cooldown is higher by 10 across the board. Magic damage per wave is stronger across the board. The heat. Healing per wave is the same. Slow duration, 1.25 seconds. Slow amount. Keep increasing. So, Yumi can steer the waves to follow her mouse. For ally champions, the waves heal. The heal is increased by 130% on her best friend. Jesus. All excess healing is converted to a shield. Lasting th they gave her overheal as well? What the... F anyway. The waves deal damage and apply a stacking slow. Does that mean it doesn't root anymore? Right? It used to root, didn't it? Or am I just going crazy? I swear after two waves hit, it would root them, right? I swear I've not paid a lot of attention to Yumi. I just remember that as a character, she annoys the hell out of everyone else. 
So yeah, they took that out. Waves also grant Yumi's best friend armor and magic resistance for the duration. Come on, man. There's way too much on this. Like... <sighs> Like, just so we're clear, right? Janna only gives, like, you know, the shield, bit of AD, so on and so forth. Nami gives a bit of on-hit damage. Fucking Yumi? All three of them. Gives on-hit damage, gives attack speed, and now it gives armor and magic resist as well, for just being involved. They literally just made her into a moving item. Like, just a moving buff item. Like, what the fuck? This is such a silly idea. Oh. This is the thing, right? Like, the kit itself doesn't feel like it's particularly changed from what it had before. However, the funny thing is that, like, what she actually grants to her new, like, empowered AD carry now just makes them overpowered. Right? Like, I'm not going crazy. But yeah, I, the more I think about Yumi and the changes here, like I just, wait, we could, it certainly sounds that way. I mean, look, every item that you can think of in previous lives has basically just been like shoehorned onto Yumi's kit, right? They shoehorned Ardent Sensor onto her, onto her, wait, which, which one gives which? I've got to remember this now. <laughs> they shoehorned the, what is this? I think although a W and E, they shoot her like Ardent Sensor to just literally just give her that amount. Yeah, she gets she gets on hit healing. Sorry, that you get you give them life steal from the W. You give on hit damage from the if you hit with your Q, you give them on hit damage, and if you use your if you use your ulti while attached. No, oh, sorry. If you just if you just your waves hit your best friend, your they get armor and magic resist. So they just give they just it's just steroid mania. Like how like you just make these characters so damn big. Like can we just go back to like this big problem already? Like we already talked about the fact that healing is busted, right? If like healing does this much, why do we still not have actual viable grievous wounds choices? They don't give a damn thing comparatively, right? Like the only way to win is to just outburst the healing. And if you if you fall behind at any point, it's just oppressive. It's just insane. And in some cases the agency for that is just absolutely removed. I can't find any universe where that seems to be fun, but people are just like rolling right into it like like there's a like there's a good thing, you know? I don't feel that at all. I feel like this, like this character just just enforces the shittest things about enchanters that no one like enjoys, you know? It just seems so wrong to me. Oof. Like, the more I think about it, the more I, like, I'm sorry for, like, the, the blanket moments of silence, but, like, the more I think about it, the more I, I wonder just, like, how enforceably annoying this actually gets. Like, if I, like, I can't really recall, like, how much you're comparing it to an old kit, right? But when you actually look at the, just the sheer amount of just battiness of all the like things that you're like shoehorning into a kit that just seems to be way too much you know
like oh. But yeah, so, right, probably we'll then stop thinking about it. Problem solved. Yeah, look. <laughs> can't can't do that. Have a job to do. Sorry, Rito Games. Have to actually do my job here. I'm like uh, some people on the balance team that just think that, you know, throwing, <laughs> throwing everything at the wall and everything happening to stick seems like a really good idea for your boy. But this is where we're at. So Yumi now gives unbelievable amounts of steroids and... Also scales with healing and shielding, shielding power more than she scales with AP. So there's actually reasons to build both. Can you get a, a, a build that hits the sweet spot on both sides of it? Possibly. But I do wonder if people are just going to lean into the idea of just being a full out steroid bot and then just running exhaust and ignite and, or heal even. And just being in that spot to just not get countered by anything. Just seems nasty when you think about it. Like every time I look at this, I just wonder just how much, how much this will like cause issues. Like even if it's not good in pro, this is still like a situation where like, like if someone gets pocketed this hard in a game, it just makes them like, it just makes them smurf way too hard because they can just do enforceably stupid decisions and get away with it because of just how much is given from that. Like actually, I just want to figure this out now, right? Where is... Hang on. Uh, League of Legends Ardent Sensor. So Ardent Sensor, right? It gave attack speed and then 5 to 20 based on the target's level magic damage on hit on basic attacks. This will give 10 to 20 and then plus 10% AP. So vaguely maybe another 20 damage roughly right let's just say that and then this damage is increased this is the best part it's increased by the allies critical strike chance so it can be anywhere up to like 50 plus damage more than that even right it could be it could be almost plus 100 per fucking auto right so if you've got characters that do like you know multiple attacks or you've got cogmore that just you know machine guns attacks You've got this like insane amount of just on hit damage that's coming out. Most of it being hard, incredibly hard to mitigate. That's like mom, Nami buffer perma. It's when you hit a Q. So if you hit a Q for five seconds, you get the thing. But obviously, like ability haste will fix that, right? So ability ability haste fixes that. So you can actually have the buff up permanently as long as you are on your best friend and are hitting Qs, which wouldn't be that difficult all things considered right all things considered it's not that difficult but and considering that like the actual missile can do up to 380 damage plus like ap scaling that's a bit scary so yeah to say that i'm nervous about this is a bit of an understatement it just, it creates way too many problems. I don't know how to feel about that. But yeah, the more I think about it, the more I wonder just how much trouble this is going to cause. Because you've literally just given an overpowered ardent sensor to your to your ADC. That scales. It's sca that's the thing, it actually scales to it. The other one didn't ever. Right? This makes me very nervous to think about now.
Like, just shit. Like, just for the sheer amount that it gives, I'm, I'm just incredibly... I'm so nervous about this now. Like, the more I think about it, the worse it gets for me. You know? Like, you got to remember as well, Ardent Sensor is already in the game still. Is it worth building on top of it? Yeah, maybe. But, you know. Like, yeah. That, like, that really... Oh. I wouldn't say it's as necessary as it would have been before, but I mean, get, having it for free on Yumi just kind of seems nasty, don't you reckon? Yeah, nah, not sure how I feel about that. That makes me very nervous. Let's just go on to the next one before I die a little bit internally. Okay, Aatrox. W cooldown decrease late, slow now increases with rank, R bonus AD granted, increased later. So Aatrox was slightly over nerfed as a reaction to his dominance last season. We felt that his Q and E were relatively capped on power and didn't want to put strength back into those skills. So instead we opted to make his W scale into late game better. As an important tool for catching enemies, the slow needs to be more powerful to pull enemies later in the game when movement options are faster and more plentiful. The R buff is another way to give some scaling power back into his kit as well. So the Infernal Chains... Lowered by two cool, uh, two seconds cooldown later on, and then instead of twenty five percent slow at all ranks, it now scales up to thirty five percent slow. Honestly, not as bad as I was expecting it to be. I was kind of expecting that slow to be higher. I was expecting it to be almost fifty, but that's okay. It's still manageable to deal against. And then bonus AD instead of twenty thirty forty percent is now twenty thirty two point five and forty five percent AD. So it's not a huge buff, but a buff nonetheless. I don't think uh, Nail will be too happy about the changes to Aatrox, but I mean, a buff is a buff, right? Can't, can't, beggars can't be choosers, you know? The bloody Trox, though, that's a strange name to put it, but yeah, we'll go with it. Aish. Q mana cost decreased, empower duration decreased, W base damage decreased, R cooldown increased early, decreased late. So, Ash is a cool ha <sighs> Every time I read this stuff, I just want to die. Anyway, for Solik, for Solik, she's balanced with ADC and support even across MMR. So she's completely reigning supreme over all support picks in pro play right now, and her ban rate is rapidly becoming is rapidly climbing. Sorry, in Solik as well. Here are some nerfs focused on support Ash with some compensation buffs for ADC. So mana cost is down on Q. The empower duration is upped, which is yeah good for that. And then the volley. So the volley is the main one they have to hit. So minus base damage on the volley. Which isn't the worst thing in the world. Still gives the AD ratio, so it helps for that. Um, and then Enchanted Crystal Arrow, it is now 100 seconds. <laughs> Plus 20 seconds in the early game. Fucking yeet. All right. I'm happy with that. I'm happy to see those changes go in. I swear, like, I, everyone talks about how cool Ash... They didn't end up going through a Q being castable whenever. To be fair, though, it's not a particularly good thing to have because, like, if you if that becomes an enable like an enabled thing, oh, it just gets a bit scary. But eh, what do I know? You said cool. Fuck off, Vega. You're dead to me. But yeah, I know everyone thinks that like Ash is like a like an interesting support play because like you know hitting lo the long range crystal arrows is amazing. But that is literally not even close to the reason why anyone picks this character. <laughs> It's just for all the oppressive constant spam slowing that goes on. It's like, ha ha, we do the funny. But no, it's, yeah, just not even close to a thing. All right, Aurelian Soul. Health growth and armor growth decreased. Good. Q burst AP ratio decreased. Ooh, okay. Aurelian Soul has made quite the impact with the CGU, and we're glad that so many of you have been excited to try him out. While he's sitting at a relatively healthy spot in high level plays, performance at lower skill levels is a bit too powerful. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Vega? <laughs> it means you shit. <laughs> uh, I think I hate about Ash is how convoluted a Q actually. Yeah, it's pretty fucking stupid. You know, crit scaling and so unnecessarily. Yeah, it's a bit weird, yeah. The, 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 the whole frost shot on the passive thing was a bit fucking daunting to deal with, but um, it's, it's not going to get any easier, unfortunately. I kind of wouldn't know I permanent him, but I mean, I do have 100% win rate on him. Fucking do. But yeah. 
And these nerds should up Kova's power and just a bit to help his adjust his skill skew. So health growth, oh, that's not even that much. Armor growth, somewhat useful. Breath of Light. So burst proc damage, 20 to 40 based on level. Only the AP ratio part has been nerfed by 5%. That's not even that horrible, honestly. It still does a chunk of damage. It'll be feelable when you hit two bursts in a row, but again, just Honestly, after the last two leg sessions, I just want to uninstall. I need to not play the game if I'm feeling tired because it's a shit time. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, to be fair, Shane did tell you to go to bed. You should have just listened to her. Next time, I'm just going to tell you to go to bed. You big poopy. All right. Azir. Base stats, passive, Q, W, and E. All adjust. Jeez, this is a fucking... This is a go. Alright, so Azir is a pretty nifty champion. It's exciting to watch. However, the vast majority of players even challenge don't find appropriate success with it. Appro what does appropriate success mean? Appropriate success. What is that? What is it? Here's the rationale behind these changes. First, we weaken his early game and give him compensation in the late game. Second, push him away from early Q poke and awkward soldier spam to raise his overall DPS otherwise. Third, update his base stats to bring back Nash's Tooth as a viable option. Fourth, buff tools that especially help fledgling Azir players, more auto attack damage in case his soldiers aren't in range, and a stronger passive turret that's up more frequently so that Shurima's legacy itself can protect him. I swear Dirty Bird doesn't, the term doesn't exist in the States though. Like we know Dirty Bird, because Dirty Bird's how, how we talk about it. But I don't think that's actually a term in the States, is it? Also, Dominoes for Civil would be totally be a thing considering the skin, but I feel like that ship sailed, right? I don't think I can actually come back to that anymore. Anyway, I don't, I don't get what what the words appropriate success mean. A chroma, yeah, possibly, possibly, but yeah, I don't understand that. You know. Anyway, uh, base health. So lowered base health, more armor growth, less base mana. Mana growth. Wait, so this part, this change actually ended up going in. Uh, mana growth 36 to 40. Not huge. Attack damage growth up to 3.5. That's okay. Autos do the goods. Base attack speed not changed, but the ratio now goes up. So therefore it scales better with, yeah. So it scales better with Nash's tooth, which is what they were aiming for. That makes sense. So... <clears throat> Changes to the passive Sharima's legacy. So the duration is now 30 seconds. The damage is higher, much higher. Wow. Okay. That's pretty huge. And then bonus damage to champions doesn't exist anymore because it does a ba higher base damage, which means, but even still it killing minions faster is still helpful. So that's cool. Special effects. I see as Zandix will now apply Azir's spell effects as a single target spell. So it applies Rylize. Just a note. It does, it will definitely apply Rylize. Which means that if you build correctly, it can also apply Horizon Focus. <laughs> that seems a bit stupid. But uh, apparently the tower was never buffed when the towers were buffed. No, it wasn't, no, because it's very easy to kill. That's, the, that's why I keep telling people, like, it's actually so easy to just murder that tower when it comes up because you just literally walk up and beat on it. It's not, not a difficult thing to do at all. People just don't seem to understand that. But yeah, now it's been buffed to 3, 3k health, which is okay. Sundisk armor is now... Oh, it's so bad early game now. Oh, it's so bad early game. But it's been much better late game. Magic resist is the scaling thing again. Loses 100 armor while Azir is far away or dead. <clears throat> Instead, loses 100 armor and magic resist while Azir... Okay, so it's basically the same shit. And then cooldown. 180 seconds, now 90 seconds. The cooldown begins after the sun disc falls. Eat shit. Azir's Sundance will no longer lose armor and magic resist while Azir is untargetable. Grim. Okay. Alright, so Q changes. Magic damage is nerfed across the board. This will be a buff at 200% at 200 AP or above because of the thing. Yep, that makes sense. And then the mana cost is now scaled up to 85. Oh, wow, jeez. It's actually just a, a nerf all the way across the board for that. Okay. Including the base mana change. That is pretty painful for Q poke. So I uh, don't really give you much of a... Yeah, okay. Anyway. W. So they don't give attack speed, but they give additional magic damage. Oh dear. Okay. And then total magic damage. 
50 to 150 is now 50 to 200 based on level and W rank. Oh. Wait, just to double check. Hang on. I'm just double checking something because I just want to just be sure about what I'm what I'm thinking in my head right now before I run my mouth. Because I'm wondering how exactly that will actually scale up if you do or do not actually use that ability correctly. But since you you will always level Q then W then E anyway, so this doesn't particularly hurt you. But how much does it actually grant over the course of time? Not much. Anyway, three is not a party. Bonus attacks be granted while zero three soldiers has now been removed. So there's no reason to spawn numerous soldiers anymore. It's only purely for the damage now. So, at least for a conservative, like, thing, there's no ability to min-max, so you're better off just conserving the mana early game no matter what, because there's no all-in power that you can really get, and you're better off just, like, sitting with two soldiers on either side of the wave and just keeping the, keeping the, the zone. I don't really see that being perfect for you, but, you know, we can try. You can try. And then the E change... Just so we're clear, this is on top of the other changes he had last patch where like his ulti still does insane damage and shit too, right? Because that makes sense. Either way, magic damage, 60 to 220 is now... Oh wait, they just nerfed the ratio on his E. Never mind. So they just took that away as well. <laughs> That's interesting. I don't know what to make of this. Like... Like, just so we're clear, right? I... <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just want to just make this clear. I understand that the character is doing well. I understand that some players are doing better, like, with with the character than others. And, like, some people are enjoying him across the board. But isn't that kind of what you're intending to happen? Like, he's a 50% win rate-ish. Like, he's not doing badly. But where, what exactly does Riot define as appropriate success? You think, you think he needs an Aurelian soul level kit rework? I don't think he needs a rework. I think I think he just needs to be left alone. I don't understand. Like the, the character itself is not particularly overpowered now. Like there were times like when he when his like kit gave way too much like base power and safety for what he was doing, it was just kind of nasty, but it's not the case now. Like there's actually like an element of gambling that goes into playing Azir with that, like by default. But yeah, like, Q-Poke was always busted. It always did way too much for the safety it gave. And, like, that's been toned down, which is understandable. But what the hell does the term appropriate success mean? The problem is he has the largest pro solo Q win rate difference of any champ, I think, is the problem. No. Because even in Ryze's previous states, he was never at the level of fucking bonkers that Azir, like, could be perceived to be. The only thing that changed for Rise was the was the items. I don't think Azir ever ever had this problem. He never had such a garbage win rate in sol in solo queue that that and still had a good one win rate in pro. He had both be terrible and both be good at the given time because that's what balance is supposed to technically look like right it's just that for some reason people were just angry that he was winning for different reasons in different skill brackets and that's just fucking weird to me like leave well enough alone at that point you want to see him pushed into bot lane eh, i suppose but like people wanted like cassiopeia and shit to end up in bot lane and that just never fucking happened it's like you, you need a consistent damage that isn't completely hard counted by by items and it's just not really yeah but I mean, right now he can build technically, he can build like some level of on hit and such, but I wouldn't say it's enough to like just warrant the big change. But yeah, for some reason, the term appropriate success is just not sitting right with me. Like it's like Riot have this idea of how they expect the character to play out and just does not seem to be playing into like what they want. And that is just really, really hurting, the, like really hurting me. It's such a weird way to go about it, I think. But yeah, appropriate success is definitely the term that I'm not flying with today, apparently. Let's just, yeah, let's just move on before I get angry. <laughs> Caitlin, 
Base armor decrease, base attack damage decrease. It doesn't take an ace detective to see that Caitlyn is the queen of ADCs season pro play right now. As the wielder of a sniper rifle, she's entitled to her long range and punchy auto attacks, but only, uh, only while they're within reason. After these changes, she'll be a bit easier to kill when caught. You'll have a bit more time to find that opening. I mean, base attack damage nerfs are understandable. Base armor nerf, understandable. I, it just gets to such a bad point. Hey, Glove, how you doing, mate? I appreciate not getting too tapped by Caitlyn. Base attack damage has never really affected that. It's just the state of items and the way she scales. Like, headshot scaling has always been kind of bonkers. And I don't see them changing that anytime soon, so you're just going to have to, you know, deal with that. You know? It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's definitely not the best. <laughs> there are ways to approach it, believe it or not. But yeah, making her less of a lane bully, I suppose, is the first step, because, you know, Caitlyn does the range thing, but... Yeah, a little too much Ungabunga zoning. You reckon? I don't know. Not the worst thing in the world. Caitlyn still has her uses. I was actually reading that really cool thread where Wolf like criticized um like the bot lane meta for all the LCK teams. And like how like strong strong teams have a different meta like for bot lane choices compared to weak teams. And that was such like a really good, like well like well thought out piece about like how that plays out. It's really cool to to read. If any of you haven't seen it, go go find it. It's really good. Alright, Fizz. W mana restoration increased. E playful damage adjusted. Mana, uh, mana cost decreased. Okay, so. Fizz still hasn't found his land legs this season. While he performs adequately against most immobile mages, his more common AD matchups are having a field day bullying him. In these tough matchups, Fizz finds himself having to choose between spells to dodge abilities or kill minions, but their enormous mana cost makes each choice lose lose. Good, I say, fuck it. Yeah, look, that's okay. You can hate Fizz all your life. But yeah. We'll be increasing his mana in lane so that Fizz will have a few more casts out of the E while in lane, but we'll still need to weigh the cost of clearing versus having kill pressure. So the Sea Stone Trident now actually restores all of the mana when you use it to, to last hit, which is kind of crazy. 100% of the mana cost inclusive, that's kind of nuts. You can actually use it correctly, so that kind of helps. And then, the magic damage of... Trickster, slightly higher base, same ratio, mana cost lowered to 95 at max rank. I mean... It's nice having some characters with the ability to actually just restore their mana to get that steroid on last hitting. Because it helps, like, it helps with the basics of the game, and a lot of people need that sort of help to, to get a leg up in the in the state of things. I do think that Fizz should have to choose, though. Like, I think Fizz not being able to choose between... Like, you know, not having to choose between, like, you know, using E to clear or E to fight is, like, I feel like that's a necessity. Because if he didn't have to care about it, then he'd just automatically win every lane. Because he could just hang on to E no matter what and then use it to pop shit. This seems like such a weird way to, like, approach it. Like, Fizz was just always good for that. It shouldn't be, like, a... It shouldn't be any sort of philosophical decision about, like, whether or not he should or shouldn't. It's the fact that it, it, it's a choice that he should have to make, always. Gangplank. Oh, boy. Passive damage decreased. E now sh shows all players how many kegs he has. Keg recharge rate has been increased. So, Gangplank currently has, in the top 25% of champions, for win rate lost due to low mastery players trying and failing. Thus, a balanced Gangplank is likely one who rests below 50% win rate until that trend changes. So let's talk tactics. Gangplank has armed himself with the newly buffed Essence Reaver and Navori Quick Blades. Suddenly he has very short cooldowns and no mana cost concerns. Yeah, doy! Accepting that these items are his core build now, he still needs to have appropriate downtime. In addition, now that he built substantial AD and critical strike chance, Trial by Fire is just dealing too much damage. 
Right, so bonus true damage is now 50 to 250 instead of 55 to 310. Makes sense. Still the same ratio, still based on critical strike chance as well. And keg chat. All players will now be able to see the number of kegs Gangplank has available beneath his health bar, which is good. Been trying to figure that out for a while. Keg recharge rate is now 18 seconds at all ranks. Ooh. Slightly hurtful towards the end, but that works out nicely. I mean, just by default, the throughput that Gangplank puts out now with Essence Riven of Ori Quick Blade is just fucking bonkers. Like we can we can all agree to that. There's no real like no real adjusting period that like you know makes that any better or worse. But man, like yeah, the passive doing insane amounts of damage was pretty painful, especially given that it's true damage. The fact that it's refreshable still is still like yeah, no real giant change there. But yeah, I don't. Like, I like that Navori Quick Blades are useful now. It just It's just insane how much damage that, like, some characters do with it. It's just bonkers to me. I can't really fathom that. There's too much damage, man. I've been literally one-shot multiple. Get, yeah, look, it's understandable. The funny thing is, is that this is still a, an ability that is that has its own built-in armor penetration as well. So it's just such a... Oh, it's just insane. Like, the fact that the Powder Keg ignores armor is just bonkers too. Like, he doesn't have to build, like, a standard AD carry either, because he just gets all that extra freedom out of his kit for nothing. Just for existing. It's not right. Jinx. Attack speed growth increased. W mana cost decreased. Slow increased. R damage cap to monsters increased. Jinx hasn't been popping off thanks to the IEO Navori second purchase changes, and her power isn't quite up to par with her marksman peers, so we're comfortable giving her a little more punch. Not saying that word. It sounds silly when I say it. <laughs> These changes should help W feel more effective with only one point in it while the R changes are there to help Jinx have a shot at the sweet cross map Baron steals. So attack speed growth is now higher. Well done. W mana cost lowered, slow upped, especially early game, so it doesn't feel so horrible. And then the damage cap against monsters is now up to 1200. So basically the same as what Smite was, which is helpful if it hits the mark. So well done. Well done. At least it didn't get to a point where it was almost above it, so that's kind of kind of helpful in a way. But that damage cap is kind of nasty. Certainly brings the damage. Brings all the damage. All that lovely damage. Kennen. Wow. Kennen's alive. I did forgot about this character for a little while there. Q cooldown decreased. Magic damage increased. W range indicator for mark targets is... Oh, it's actually... There's actually a range indicator now. Thank the lord. All right. E damage to minions increase. So Kennen has been lacking an exciting mage feeling for a while now. Additionally, his farming, especially on a turret, makes the champion difficult for players to pick up and find success. We also wanted to give Kennen players a range to Kennen on W to help clarify the range at which Kennen can hit enemy champions when they're marked. Should be especially useful when fighting near minions. Very helpful. So yeah, the Q cooldown... One second off early, which is helpful. Magic damage, slightly higher as you scale up, so that helps. So, yeah, range indicator, will that be visible? Can when an enemy champion becomes marked? That's very good. And then lightning rush, the burn damage to minions modifier instead of 50% is now 65%. Helps for the wave clear. Very good. For some reason, though, every time I think back and I remember how busted Kennen used to be, it always seems to come back to, like, all the way back to Will of the Ancients and how much everyone hated that item. Dear Lord, those were the days. Those were the fucking days. Anyway, LeBlanc. Q now refunds 100% of mana and 30% of cooldown upon killing you. Oh, we're doing another one of these. Okay. Now deals bonus damage to minions. Our bonus damage to minions is replicated on the RQ cast. Blanc always struggled with a balancing act between clearing ways and assassination power, which is partially untrue because W, but yeah, I get it. I, I get that, like, you know, having to commit a cooldown for it is a bit silly, but that's kind of the point. Anyway, in Solo Q, she boasts one of the highest average kills, but is also some of the lowest average minions killed. 
That means that the players can perfectly last hit with auto attacks and save their W for trading, get a much larger jump in power compared to other champions. This has resulted in LeBlanc being, well, not the strongest champion. We're aiming to smooth out her power curve so that if LeBlanc players wanted to guarantee some last hits, they're sacrificing a small cooldown without completely losing out on their mana pool and lane pressure. So, killing a unit will either, with either part of Sigil of Malice, with either part of Sigil of Malice, Restores 100% of the mana cost and 30% of the spell's remaining cooldown. Sigil of Menace now deals up to 10 to 146 bonus damage to minions. Crazy. And then the Mimic. The RQ now Mimic the bonus damage to minions of the original ability. Crazy. So we have another champion that now has a full mana cost refund. For that, I feel like we're just going to start creating mages that just have like Q abilities that just get you refunds at this point. So yeah, that or just have like good control mage level wave clear, so it doesn't affect their uh, thing for it. Cries and Annie doesn't Annie have that? Or did they take it off all those moons ago? Oh, it's the cool... Yeah, no, yeah, the Q cooldown still does it. It's still there. It's still there. You get half the cooldown back, and the whole mana cost is refunded on Q. You're a chimp, beggars, if you forgot that. It's always been there. It's never gone away. Now it's just standard. Oh, you, that's what you mean. Okay. To be fair, though, the only reason... The only reason that Annie had it was because it was a, it was a barrier of entry for new new players not the other way around it wasn't like supposed to not like shoehorned in as an effort to keep characters relevant it's actually <laughs> something that helped new players be better at the game i do feel like league is starting to really try hard to like to cater to the to player bases being terrible but yeah her auto hit like a noodle but she has the, one of the highest base attack ranges in the game too so it's kind of like crazy for that anyway pantheon the man pan so Base health regeneration decreased, attack speed increased, Q cooldown decreased early, mana cost decreased, Q tap wind up time decreased. Wait, the wind up time is decreased? That's crazy. E cooldown de increased late. So Pantheon has been underperforming in the top lane lately, and his mid lane power has performed even worse. Hey, well done, Pan. Pan. <laughs> what you're saying is AD. I mean, people have tried it before. While we do support Pantheon's ability to flex into mid, this round of buffs is intended to help his performance at top lane more. We're also addressing some game health concerns around how Pantheon can access his E in the late game when specking into ability haste builds. So, base health regen lowered, understandable. Attack speed upped, okay. Comet Spear. So the cooldown is down by two seconds early. Caps out at the same. The mana cost is much cheaper, but the wind up time is faster. That's actually kind of nuts. That is kind of nuts. His win rates are great both lanes. I'm confused. Depends where you're looking. In pro, they're non-existent. <laughs> and then Aegis Assault up by two seconds late on the E cooldown. Honestly, faster Q speed. It's always nice. It's quite, quite helpful. But I mean, diverting power into being offensive rather than defensive, I'm totally for it, personally. I'm still awkward on Pantheon having attack speed as a caster. It never, it never seems to be like a thing you really care for. But yeah, no biggie. Kiana. Q base damage increased, E cooldown decreased. So Kiana, like other roaming mid laners, have been struggling to find success recently. We're introducing a bit more damage into her kit and some cooldown on her mobility spells so she's able to move around the bat a bit more. So, plus 20 bo uh, base damage later on. No changes to the ratio. And then E Audacity. Minus one second across the board. Okay. Converts into more empowered. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I can roll with that. Maybe, like, the whole win rate succession thing is just about how well they actually just, like, execute ganks. Because it seems like a lot of roaming mid laners are just being buffed for that exact reason. But, yeah. Anyway. Ramus. 
Attack damage growth decrease, Q base damage decrease. Ramus is still powerful after everything is shaken out in the jungle. We're tapping down a bit of his damage, so he's a little less of a murder murderadillo, but still able to keep his core strengths intact. Seems a bit odd to have to nerf Ramus of all people. Mans just gets in the way and everyone gets unhappy about it. It's very, very saddening. But I digress. All right. Rumble. E magic resist shred increase. Total shred on the two. What? Rumble is very sad and definitely not overheating, especially in his primary role of top lane. He's historically been an early spiking champion whose entire power budget is wrapped up in his ability to win the first few team fights. This time we're giving him some tools aimed at scrapping it out in the late game. Holy Moses, they doubled the shred. Or effectively doubled the shred. So, in late, in later stages of leveling the E, it is a 20% and then a 40% shred. Fucking hell. You're going to murder tanks with that. Don't even need, You might not even need Void Staff anymore as long as you hit the shit correctly. But I mean, having Void Staff and that might be a nice little multiplicative scale since, you know, you cut through more than half of someone's magic resist. Nasty. That's just nasty. Just nasty. All right, Samira. Passive movement speed per stack increase. So Samira was nerfed in 13.4 as a way to address her early game snowballing and drain tanking. However, this nerf went too far and made her weak because she, when she was supposed to be balanced. Yeah, that seems like the right game's approach to everything. Uh, these changes have simply walk back the severity of some of those nerfs. She still shouldn't have to ban her, but now Samira players should be able to enjoy playing Samira. For... I thought this was supposed to be... I don't understand. This is... This is technically... So it's an early game buff, late game nerf. Doesn't really matter too much. People still hate the character for what she brings to the table by default. Eh... I guess. Like, it's nice for the early game change, but that kind of pisses people off more. It's just harder to kill her in some cases. Scary. Anyway, Trindamir. Health, growth, and AD... Oh, no. Trindamir has fallen a bit behind in terms of his power levels, but rather than buffing his early game, these buffs should help Trindamir scale better into the match. A bit more survivability. Pardon me. A bit more survivability and some harder-hitting auto attacks. I can live with that. It's getting crit streaked in the early game that really ruins me. Riot throwing Nisa bone? Dear lord, dude. I don't think Riot could actually help with that situation at all. He's only made it harder for himself at this point. Anyway. <clears throat> I mean, all in all, it's helpful, but not enough to make you go crazy. <clears throat> Twitch nerfs. EAP ratio decrease. So, oh, AP Twitch, you're one of my favorite champions. You're also overpowered. You're also incredibly frustrating to play against if you don't have to actually lane, <laughs> since you can be anywhere at any time. At least Evelyn has to wait until level six. That's the worst part of it, honestly. Back off of Evelyn's niche, you jerk. I'd say you stink, but you probably like that. Who wrote this patch note? <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck? Anyway. E contaminate. Magic damage per stack is now 30% AP instead of 35. It's not a huge nerf, but it, it, it helps, I suppose. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's just very, very painful if you get hit by that stuff. But this is all they're changing, is just the actual stack, the damage per stack, which is very painful. Don't get me wrong, but if you're so mad about Twitch's early game roaming presence, why not nerf the Q? And don't get me wrong, the damage is insane. I'm glad it's nerfed a bit, but like, come on. What, what are you aiming for here? Anyway, Zaya. E base damage decreased, cooldown increased. Zaya's buffs in patch 13.1 ended up going a bit too far, buffing under the upper echelons of AD carries. Players are finally catching on to her soaring power level, so she needs to be addressed. We're happy with her higher attack speed, but she's simply dealing too much damage right now. So... Blade Call of Physical Damage has been lowered by 5 across the board. Okay. And then the cooldown is upped by 1 second across the board. I'm not sure the damage changes. Unless that's damage per blade. Is that what that is? 
If I'm to assume that's actually just based on damage per blade. Let's just double check. I just want to double check the tooltip against what it is on the wiki just to make sure that I'm correct on this. Um, blade caller. Yeah, it'd be per feather. Uh, it caps at... Oh, uh, it's reduced damage by 10% per... Wait. It's just based on level scaling, which is very hard to figure out when you're actually like very much getting through it. This doesn't like hurt your like thing too much. You still want to hit a few feathers on them at a time, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, the cooldown hurts a little bit, but I mean, yeah. This is this is more of a warning shot than anything else by the look of it. Yorick, bonus damage from ghouls decreased. This patch will be nerfing Yorick's uninteractive blast you with ghouls playstyle so that being caught by 1e with lethality builds doesn't end your <laughs> So, am I, am I meant to believe that, the, that someone got absolutely murdered by this in an ARAM game and this is suddenly a problem? Is that, is that what I'm getting from this? This should bring down the overall power of this frustrating place, though, but we'll be keeping an eye out to make sure Yorick isn't completely underground after these changes. I did not think that anyone cared about this. Is this actually a thing? Do people actually get tilted over this Yorick build? Real talk? Do people actually just hate this Yorick build? Ghoul bonus damage is now 30% instead of 40. This is applied up to 8 times per ghoul. I mean, look, Considering how easy it is to kill those ghouls, I, I find it a bit strange that like that people are actually at this point of believing that it's overpowered. But you know what? You do you, right? You do you. Z base magic resist decreased, E cooldown decreased late. Once he has Cerulus or whatever. Yeah, I mean the Cerulus thing is kind of busted, but that's like you know you can't rush it. And it like yeah, it's supposed to be good for that later on. It is kind of nuts that the ghouls do apply the Cerulus passive though. It's fucking nasty. Anyway, in 1223's hotfix, we've hit Zed's late game E shadow slash cooldown along with a couple of other those to bring down his win rate and ban rate. These succeeded, but left Zed's late game combo is feeling pretty awkward and eliminated some of his coolest shadow shenanigans. We think his win rate is in a pretty good spot for a quick combo centric assassin, so we're adding a small nerf in exchange for reverting the original cooldown change. So the cooldown is now three seconds at late game, but instead they've nerfed his base magic resist to 29. Nasty. Actually under 30 for the first time. That's fucking crazy. Very painful for Zed. Okay. Jungle adjustments. We experimented with junglers having advantages in their own jungle for clearing camps to disincentivize early counter jungling and keep new old jungle players from getting dominated from minute one. Early invades and steals are among the more miserable experiences in the role and a major contributor to players not opting into jungle. That being said, the cost the rest of the game with respect to early ganking and safety and some higher level strategy have seemed too high. So we're pulling this mechanic back. We're glad we've explored this and we always believe it's worth trying changes that we think can help rather than being afraid of the potential downsides. So junglers deal increased damage to their own camps and scuttle is now 20% increased damage to all camps. Just crazy, isn't it? Just crazy. So yeah. Counter jungling actually is is doable now. Just make it for the first X minutes of the game. Nah, fuck it. Have it all or nothing, Vega. This is this is the right way. All or nothing. In before this bugs out, you do like quadruple damage to fucking Baron and Dragon. How is that not the obvious solution? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd like to think so. 
You'd certainly like to think so, but unfortunately, simplicity is just not right its wheelhouse. But again, time gating sections of the game is just fucking painful. Unless they go for the 14 minute mark the same way with towers, in the sense that, yeah, like it's now open to counter jungling and early interpretations of it, but I don't know, man. It just seems kinda of nuts. Might as well just put barricades. Like like the ones in the base. You might as well just put barricades on one side of the jungle so that you can't enter it. <laughs> you know? Or like make it all hex gates and just get in and out one way and one way only. You know? It's not meant to be done that way, Vega might. It's not meant to be done. Like tower blading for the jungle. Yeah, it's just fucking bonkers. He wished you could lock the jugglers in their own map for the first 10 minutes, but then like, look, I, I get, I get the sentiment behind it, but like, how would you not get bored? You know, like it would be boring. You just sit there, farm the jungle timeout box. Fuck it though. It'd be a level of boring that you just literally cannot fathom, bro. AFK farm every game. Like, you you know what you would do. That's the thing. Every, like, jungler would just... You just pick, like, Shivana and fucking, like, Udi and like all those, like, really, like, heavy spear-clearing junglers. It's just nasty. I remember when I actually paid attention to Pats Nights. Ah, oh, that's okay. Game's still here, despite you not being here. So, the show must go on, Mr. Halkria. Jungle Camp Gold. We introduced the jungle treat system in pre-season, which allows in fucks of gold into the jungle. Pulled a fair bit of gold away from individual camps. This matter swung heavily toward gankers, so we're compensating some gold back into the camps now that we've drained some from treats. So, up by 10, up by 10, up by 5, up by 1, up by 5, 5, 1, 10. So, buffs are up by a bit. Big singular camps are up by 10, essentially. Helpful for that. Net gain across the jungle thing. It's always good. Jungler lane experience. Junglers can get very ahead. Oh, they're actually fixing this. Thank God. Junglers can get very ahead of their enemies by sapping early lane experience on ganks or when catching waves for dead allies. We think junglers who commit to early ganks should fall behind in experience to an enemy who is regular farming, so this change should help reinforce that. Thank God. I just, I can't even believe that this is actually a possibility that a jungler can just get ahead because I killed his top laner and he's like, well, I guess I get to farm that guy's lane and end up level five while everyone else is level three. Fucking hell. Oh, it's just nasty. But yeah, it's, it's again, but there, we're right on the money though, Vega. Look, scaling from zero to 14 minutes. Like this 14 minute thing is becoming a becoming very much of a of a thought process for right now they think that like the game is just gonna just jump state like an, it's just gonna alter its state at 14 minutes every time they just keep putting all this like muscle onto that one particular number it's very interesting sweeping lens sweeping lens was a very powerful tool clearing out vision and forcing enemies to play safe or risk dying to the enemy jungler while this nerf will be felt more in the early game it should also help tune down vision denial throughout the game as a whole two minute cooldown early game i am praying that it will stop dumb shit junglers from doing the early ward go back and buy the fucking lens trick please just please may this end please can we just stop the error of bad junglers trying to copy tarzan for the wrong reasons please just please just for all the wrong reasons <laughs> please make it stop I mean, without plates work, the other towers inevitably be four by fourteen. So most sixteen damage. Jungle. I mean, yeah, that's the point. But like, it just it, you're just kind of staking all that money on that particular like time of the game. And like, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of like how the game plays out, it's essentially the same. Like anyone that's ever had a TLP with me, like you know, like just how the how the game breaks down to the sections for the first fifteen minutes of the game. It's not abnormal, but it doesn't make it any better that like the way that they're trying to shoehorn other elements of the game into that timer as well. It just makes things weird. Makes things like it's gonna just make things worse over time. Item changes. Cosmic drive. Cosmic drive has been niche and unpopular for a while now. The stat change aims to make this item more attractive purchase for damage focused mages. So it's now ninety AP in exchange for two hundred health. So you got you gain 25 AP and you lose 200 health. Not sure how I feel about that. 
Yeah, they're ob- yeah, as I was saying, they're, they're obviously enforcing that, but like to what end? And how many more things are they going to add to that arbitrary 14-minute blockade? You know, that's like, the weird thing for me. So, yeah, Cosmic Drive. 25 AP in exchange for 200 health. Does this incentivize? I mean, if you're a scaler and you build Deathcap, probably. But again, it's not it's not useful anymore. For what it gave before, it was broken as hell, but now it just does not fit that fucking thing at all. Plated Steel Caps. Plated Steel Caps now check for a much wider range of auto attacks so that when you bonk someone with a staff, it will be well protected by Steel Caps. And auto is an auto, no matter the code. So Steel Caps now works for all auto attacks for its damage reduction rather than auto attacks tag with just auto attack and nothing else. Does that mean it affects modifiers as well? It still doesn't affect true damage, but like it affects everything, which means fucking... Pantheon and Nasus are going to have a very sad day. Kimio Q2 gets reduced because of how it works. It does not reduce true damage. It's n- like There's no way this reduces true damage. There's no way. It should never... It will never work like that. It used to already. No. Until they... Bu- okay. Okay. Just so we're clear, you're you're quoting a bug, and that is definitely a bug. It's not. It's not intended. It's not meant to be intended. If it, fuck me. If it bugs out again, and people are going to be like, "No, Rick, it's fucking intended." Shut up, all of you. <laughs> I'm just not having that. But yes, it was definitely a bug. It is kind of funny that uh, no one like opted to pick that up for a fair while though. <laughs> I had the funniest bug the other day. I was trying to play Mordekaiser. I was chasing a Rakan, right? Inside my death realm. And the funniest thing is that he actually managed to go through this gap area into Krugs, right? With his with his normal walk, and I couldn't walk in after him as Mordekaiser. He can escape it, but I can't. It's like, oh yeah, pathing's good. Smile. Fucking shit game. Anyway, Seraph's Embrace. Seraph's got a breath of new old life with its return of its shield and ability power, quickly becoming one of the most powerful mage items. As a result, most of the current meta midlanders are those who can purchase Archangel's use it to the fullest. We're doing a small efficiency nerf here to bring the outlier down a bit. However, a longer term goal is to increase mage item satisfaction and the overall power of the class by trimming some of the power from its stronger itemization and simultaneously buffing its weaker ones. So minus 10 AP, minus 50 health. Ouch. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So Archangel Staff Cop's a bit of a bit of a neutering. Eh, it's not the hugest pain of it, honestly. Anyway. Gra- oh, runes. Okay. Rune changes. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Grasp of the Undying. Healing from runes has crept up over time due to the durability patch last year and other system buffs like the updated tank items from preseason. These changes aim to slightly lower that invisible healing not coming from items. Grasp of the Undying has been benefiting fighters more than tanks with the power level of its heal. This change ad- aims to lower the overall power of the heal component and increase the stacking tank stats to make the change feel less painful for its tank users. So. Percent of maximum health healing is now 1.2% instead of 1.7 plus 3 plus 3 like 3 flat and then max health gained is now 7 instead of 5 for melee and 3 and 4 instead of 3 for rank okay Hey, Steelworth, how you doing, mate? I swear I said Shivana by accident about 20 minutes ago and you turned up. That seems to be the thing, eh? Yep. Okay, so, yeah, minor loss on the on the actual max health healing, which isn't horrible. But, I mean, getting more health. Like, this plus overgrowth is definitely looking more tempting these days. So, that's cool can roll with that 
Alright, Triumph. This Triumph chain is meant to be a net nerf that flattens the extremes of the rune, leading to slightly more healing when it matters less high HP, and slightly less healing when it matters more in low HP, with an even breakpoint around the 35% HP mark. So heal on takedown instead of 10% of missing health is now 2.5% of maximum health plus 5% of missing health. This is very sad. I'm not a Shivana main anymore. I've moved on to Max Haste Misfortune. <laughs> Max Haste Misfortune. That's oddly specific, but okay. I will give you that. I will give you that in spades. Uh, but yeah, I don't like try. I don't like the change to Triumph. I for the characters I play, like you know Olaf, fucking Alawi, Watercut. Like I, I get why. Like I want to have Triumph available in case something goes horribly wrong. But man. The actual curve of this does not mean anything unless you are like a full on like health building individual. But I mean, the, the good news about this is that it fucking nerfs it for 80 carries. Like this is the good thing. But the problem is they're all going to take overheal alongside fucking, um, what's it called? Alongside bloodthirster now. So it's just all, all in all plain painful. Ugh. ARAM adjustments don't care. Anything else? Clash is coming up. Cool. Champion pricing update. In case you missed it, we announced that we'll be altering champion pricing structure this patch. You can read more details somewhere I don't care about. New champions will still be released at a stupidly like high price. And after a week, they'll be dropped down to that. After seeing two seasons of play, they'll be dropped into one of the corresponding price tiers. So, 450 BE is champions that are awesome for new players. They have a strong fantasy and an approachable kit that our data suggests helps folks find success early. Examples include Malphite, Misfortune, and Yumi. 1350 BE, champions that are a bit more complex than the lower tier, but still approachable for interested folks. These will have more nuanced skill checks in their play patterns, but maintain reasonable skill flaws and have proven to be fan favorites. Examples include Yasuo, Lucian, and Set. Okay. Complexity. Right. Anyway, 3150 BE. Champions that have a larger degree of difficulty or specialization in their play. These will often have steeper learning curves to climb before one sees consistent success with them. Examples include LeBlanc, Shaco, and Yorick. Uh, mm. Not sure how I feel about that. LeBlanc, Shaco, and Yorick considered as steeper learning curve champions. Like LeBlanc and Shaco in like very varying directions, not mind you. Anyway, four, 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 four BE. Only perfection and beauty are allowed in this tier, and there's a bunch of laughing. I'm assuming this is the Jin tier, where only Jin is in this category. <laughs> it's a cute little inside joke you've got there, Rita Games. Hey, Mama, how you doing? Ah. Uh, Anyway, 4800 B, the majority of the roster will live here, okay? And then 6300 B, champions that have come out in the past two seasons, and after which they'll move to one tier above in the next season, and then, yeah, the new champions will come out then. That's... I'm really, I'm really interested to see what champions are in that, like that actual tier of understanding the, the middle tier, the 3150 tier, where they have steeper learning curves to climb before one sees consistent success with them. That seems like an odd jump to go from that to the majority of the roster exists in 4800 BE because reasons that seems really stale. Camille. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like it seems like such an odd, like stance to have on like the actual difficulty of your own champions but yeah who cares behavioral systems afks are a common problem in league games but our data shows us that most players who leave games do so infrequently enough that they don't ever actually get a penalty we know that sometimes disconnects happen but we still want to ensure that we still provide a reminder that leaving games always hurts your teammates for more information on our lever buster works check out this article we are continually updating and revising our systems blah 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 etc so AFK timer. There will now be a one minute Q delay penalty for all players that AFK or leave games. Okay. No more immunity. Fix the bug where sometimes frequent leavers would not get a penalty. Oh dear. Can they also fix that when I sit under tower for a minute? I don't get an AFK warning. Wait, do you actually get an AFK warning for sitting under your tower at minute one? Hilarious. Uh, 
But either way, you shouldn't be sitting under your tower. You should be helping. Helping. Okay, 32-bit client depreciation. So support for 32-bit Windows OS will be deprecated on April 4th. After this date, the 64-bit version of Windows will be required to play League of Legends and Teamfight Tact. Oh. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Are we actually past the point now where, like, where everyone has a 64-bit system by default? Are we actually at that point now? You might notice it ends when we stop supporting it and do anything. However, for those that are playing on 32-bit operating systems, starting in 13.7, you'll start to get a message in the client telling you that the client may stop wor working in the future for you. We're giving some time for the messages to fully su stop supporting 32-bit operating systems, both in the patch notes and in the launcher. In the future, you'll need to be playing on 64-bit capable hardware. Wow. Why is the league team doing this? As with other decisions we've made in the past, like deprecating XP and Vista, continuing to release new content while maintaining all the hardware requires significant investment from both a development and a testing standpoint. By removing some of these barriers, we can continue to push the boundaries of new features. Real shit, right? I gotta say, like, there are, like, this was kind of the thing with, like, Riot's entire, like, fan base is that the system requirements for all of their games are so low that it's so easy, the, the games are very easy to access. Like, they haven't changed it with Valorant yet, which is good because obviously Valorant was a terrible terrible like would be a terrible loss rather half of southeast asia turkey russia eu any america gets nuked with this i mean yeah yeah that's that's wow i was not expecting that yeah the worst part is that this this also takes the guesswork out of you know if people don't have new enough systems to record vods they definitely won't be able to play the league holy crap Oh man, I did not think that was ever going to happen for League games for at least another few years. Wow. That's such a like that's such a rip. Like if you oh. I don't think anyone in my chat No, nah, it's not even that bad for me because like I said, these people wouldn't even have the computer power to actually be able to record a VOD, so that doesn't even matter to me per se. I just, it just means that I won't have to field those questions anymore, which is kind of a win, honestly. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds a bit rude, but truthfully, like, if League doesn't support it, fucking, at least I don't have to. I just, I didn't, I really didn't think League would get to that point. I, I really thought Riot was going to lean into the whole we support all crappy systems thing. But for that, I swear, like, this is the weirdest thing, right? Actual philosophical, like, moment. Everyone is, like, really at this point in time now where they actually compare, like, League's development team to Valorant's development team. And I don't just mean, like, in regards to, like, balance and shit, right? But, like, I'm talking about, like, every single, like, decision when it comes to the development of these games, right? So we're talking about, yeah, the League runs on a toaster meme is now dead, right? But Valorant does run on a toaster. Like, Valorant literally was designed for that, despite that, right? And the funniest thing about it is that, like, you look at, like, all these things that, like, Valorant does, which are in line with what Riot was originally doing for League of Legends, and now all those things in League are gone. And the funniest part about it is, like, one of the biggest things that people, like, are actually, mistakenly, might I add, are, like, really just going head over tail for, is people are saying, like, oh my god, why on earth does Valorant have voice chat but League doesn't? And the fact of the matter is they're two fucking different games, for one. But, like, the funniest thing about it you run Overwatch better than Valorant? That is a lie. That 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 should not be fucking happening. Reinstall Valorant and and Riot Vanguard and lo and lower your settings in Valorant. Dead ass. There's no way that should be happening. Considering how Riot is approaching minor leagues and LCS, makes me assume that Riot wants to downscale. It. That's the thing. How do you get to a point where your flagship game that literally still has a higher base across the globe? is actually getting to a point where you would rather downscale that in favor of Valorant. Like, there's, there are so many weird, like, comparative, like, comparative things that people are talking about with the, with both of these games. 
and it's just oh it's just insane just an insane amount of like just oh just painful anyway dodge penalties oh are increasing proportionally to the lp increases oh yeah cool minor regions at least cost a bit of money for very little return i mean we we, we haven't had a league in two years man i don't care no more fuck fuck oh <laughs> that's, that's riot's approach to everything fuck oceanic <laughs> smile League will still be a premium in korea china and europe yeah i wonder how many pc bangs are going to go out of business because they don't have 64-bit systems <laughs> What an investment that would be. No, nah, because a lot of them would have been bought on mass in previous years. A lot of them would have to upgrade. That would be funny as hell if that's the case, though. Because a lot of them, like a lot of those places, are just cheaping out, bro. They're cheaping out way, way hard. Anyway, bug fixes. Champion select ones. Roll and text filters will clear when you lock in and ban a champion as well as when you exit. Oh, they're good. They fixed that now. Cool. Chroma selection for a skin will no longer reset when switching between different skins. Cool. Anyway, bug fixes. So fix the bug that caused watchful wardstones wards to not display the ward placement preview. God, Jesus. That was a that was a tongue twister. Anyway, fix the bug that caused Rift Herald's icon to persist throughout the game if killed at a specific time. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Fix the bug that caused Rakan's EV effects to persist. Fix the bug that caused Ravenous Hydra's cleave to not proc correctly. Ah, oh, that explains that problem. So it was bugged out. Okay. Fix the bug that caused the player's HP bar to be displayed over certain parts of the HUD. Interesting. Fix the bug that causes Aurelian Soul's Q, Breath of Light, to not account for mana regeneration and can discontinue to cast when at max rank. Ouchie. Fixed a bug that caused Azir's range indicator to display incorrectly while controlling sand soldiers to attack. Meh. Fixed a bug that causes Callista's bonded champion to not see her fate's call VFX. Some of those are annoying as hell, honestly, so I don't even care. Fixed a bug that caused Draven to cash out his passive if an enemy was executed by Aurelian Souls E. Huh. <laughs> Funny. Fixed a bug that caused Azir and Sivir's interaction VOs to not play. Saddening. Fix the bug that caused enemies altered by Lee Sin's R to sometimes not knock up their allies. Fix the bug that caused Viego's Q and E range indicators to mimic Aurelian Soul's Q after his possession of Aurelian Soul ended. Nasty. I hope they never fix the corky audio. What's the corky audio bug? Is that the, the guns blazing bug where you just all you hear is guns? <laughs> enemies alt. Oh, wait, hang on. Fixed the bug that caused Viego's Q and E range indicators to mimic Aurelian's... Oh, no, I did that one. Fixed the bug that caused Aurelian's souls are uh, falling star VFX to not be seen if cast inside of terrain. Oh, yeah, I had that bug, actually. Fixed the bug that caused Viego to uh, be unable to enter Mordecai's death realm if he had possessed Malzahar. Yeesh. Fixed the bug that caused Viego's W to not prevent damage from Zeri's Q. Fixed the bug that caused E and his molten shield damage to reflect... The reflect damage to not proc spell thief. Fixed the bug that caused Cassante ulting an enemy exactly as they died to cause his ultimate to go on cooldown. Rip. Fixed the bug that caused Akali's E to let her escape Mordecai's. Oh, that's annoying, that bug. Fixed the bug that caused Caitlyn's passive headshot to cancel the empowered basic attack if the basic attack was issued outside of her attack range. Fixed the bug that caused Rod of Ages icon to not disappear from a player's inventory after the item was purchased and refunded. Fixed the bug that caused Ezreal's W to be able to be blocked by Q while blocked by Shannon's W. Okay. Yeah, that was the thing. Akali E be broken. Yeah, look, fucking the life of Mordekaiser is very difficult. Fix the bug that causes Nunu's W to get stuck in place if he released it exactly as he appeared outside the Fong of War. Fix the bug that caused Time Kenter's ultimate to sometimes not correctly interact with Radiant Virtue. Fix the bug that caused Daisy to not despawn following Ivern's death. Fix the bug that caused Aurelian Soul's Q to not cast to not last an infinite amount of time when fully maxed. Fix the bug that caused Mundo to not immediately gain base health from his R. Fix the bug that caused Vega's evil laugh not to play upon getting a kill with his ultimate. Fix the bug that caused Kindred's VO when buying jungle items not play correctly. Skin fixes. Mythmaker Garen now has separate SFX. 
Updated store champion select and collections images for the following chroma sets, which is Battle Bunny Misfortune, Astronaut Ivan, KDA All Out, Ari, Baddest. Baddest? There's another vert? Okay, whatever. Arcana Rakan is now I'm no longer moves in an unnatural way during un idle animations. I thought they said Nunu Bug is infixable. Well, apparently it is. Keck. Star Guardian Rakan, his body no longer remains visible after dying. Hmm. Mythic Shop Rotation. Prestige Broken Covenant Misfortune is now available. Okay. Upcoming skins. Ah, it's Elden Ring Cho'Gath. Fucking scariest looking thing I've ever seen. And then Broken Covenant Misfortune, Broken Covenant Cho'Gath, Nocturne, Broken Covenant Rakan, and Broken Covenant Zaya. That looks fucking interesting. Broken Covenant Riven, Broken Covenant Vladimir, and Prestige Broken Covenant Misfortune. That is some cool ass splash art, just for the record. Dear Lord. But yeah. Some skins and shit. Poor Mord. Yeah, look, you're onto something. Infinitely less buggy than his previous iteration, but still buggy. Riven skin, time to end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can Riot finally release TSM skins? They would make bank because people would buy it for the meme? Fucking. That's the strangest thing to do. They never go wrong with Zaya and Rakar skins? Yeah, seems to be right. Seems to be right indeed. The, this fucking skin scares the hell out of me, though. You look like an Elden Ring boss. It's fucking creepy. This is like, this is the creepiest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. And I love it. I kind of want to buy it. Looks like Winter Wonderland show. Yeah, if Winter Wonderland was in fucking Chernobyl. <laughs> Winter Wonderland show. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, nuclear Winter Wonderland show. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> oh... I crack myself up sometimes. Anyway. With 1k stacks. 1k stacks would be pretty fucking insane. I can only imagine it's going to get bigger and uglier. It's going to look like those big like roaming like thingos in Elden Ring. Just get stomped on. <laughs> anyway. Thank you everyone for coming today. I hope you all enjoyed another edition of a Patch Notes Rundown. So just keeping in mind, we are now open again for all League of Legends, pa uh, not Patch Notes, <laughs> VOD reviews is what I was trying to say. We are open for all League of Legends VOD reviews. So if you if you record a VOD on 13.5 and you send me all the relevant details for it, I will review it on stream. We are trying to get more League of Legends VOD reviews done. I have literally done nothing but Overwatch content for the past two weeks, and I would really like to do more League of Legends videos. So please get the word out. If, even if you're not that much interested in playing League Ranked anymore, maybe some of your friends are. So go and ask them. Go and see if they're interested in submitting VODs for the stream. Because honestly, it would be good for all of us to get more content done. In regards to content, there will be more content being released by the end of this week on Patreon. I have already done more for the Overwatch side of it lately. There will be mentality and League of Legends stuff to talk about on Patreon in the near future. I'm going to bring that all out for this month because it's high time we've really got back into it. The content is there to be made. I just have a lot of issues with uploading lately. So hopefully that will partially get fixed. But yeah, we'll see how we go. Either way, I may come back tonight and do uh, the Overwatch patch notes then, depending on how I'm feeling. But we shall see. There's a lot of things that I have to sort out. If not, I'll just do it tomorrow. But yeah, um, that said, I hope you all enjoyed yourselves today. I hope you all are enjoying this new edition of The Dost. Don't forget to tell your friends, support the roast. If you're getting, if you wanted to get VODs in, just join the Discord. If you want to sub on Patreon, there is the Patreon link as well. Thank you everyone that came today. My name is Rec9. I love you all and I will see you all very much in the future. Love you all. Best to you. Bye-bye.